All right, so thank you all again for worshiping with us today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Jamie Smith, and I have the honor and privilege of being the director of youth ministries here at Ringgold United Methodist Church. And it's always an honor and a privilege, but I guess that privilege comes with the responsibility of discussing any passage in the Bible that uses the word youth. <laughs> that, or our pastor's just really scared of the bears. <laughs> But I don't think I blame him for that, right? I mean, it's a really scary passage. It's next level prophet gone wild, right? I mean, we were all laughing when we were reading it earlier, but that laughing was definitely a little like awkward, haha, what are we doing here? Like, why, why is this our scripture for the day? But we'll get there. Um, you know, we spend all of our time teaching our children that God loves them, and we want them safe, and this is a really safe atmosphere and safe building, and, you know, we're going to protect you. And then this man of God comes and does the exact opposite. Uh, and by now, you're probably thinking, is there a reason that we're talking about these kids being mauled at the start of our VBS week? <laughs> because if this is what we're doing in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, I don't really think I want to be your neighbor. But I can assure you, the only bears present in the church this week are Teddy Grahams, so you and your kids are all safe. Although, safe is not a word I'd use to describe the Bible. Messy, raw, surprising, wild, but definitely not safe. And I think one of the reasons we like to avoid the prophetic section in their lives is because of how unsafe their writings and experiences are. I mean, they don't fit our pretty feel-good picture of what Christianity should be, do they? So we try to appease ourselves, and we pick and choose the passages we're going to read and teach about. The things that are, have happy endings with good morals, or support the ideals and political beliefs that we each hold already, then we can ignore the rest of it. We don't talk about God calling for genocides, or Paul sending slaves back to their masters, or women hammering stakes through the head of army commanders, or prophets sending bears to attack children. But if we never talk about these passages, we'll never hear how God is working and speaking to us through them. Because God's message isn't just present in the parts of the Bible we like. God's message is in the entirety of the Bible. And in fact, it's some of these more ridiculous and wild passages that we often have the best conversations and learning periods about, especially when I'm talking to the youth. I mean, when you read these wild tales, they captivate you and they scare you. But being captivated and scared just leaves you wanting to learn more about it. So we remember these stories and the discussions we have about them. We're also more likely to remember and learn from these passages when we can connect it to something in our world today, something we see or experience on a regular basis. The kind of tangible connection we make often helps us strengthen the lessons we read. It's kind of like when I was in high school and I got the chance to actually travel to Israel. I walked where Jesus walked. I saw where all of the Old Testament battles took place and the areas where Jesus based his parables, I experienced the Bible, and I never read it the same way again. I still don't. Of course, that also happened for me when I was a youth choir member in my home church, and we used popular music to teach the lessons of Jesus. When we sang Stand By Me by Ben King or Every Breath You Take by the Police from the perspective of God. Or, Taylor Swift's love story, as we talked about how the Bible is God's love story for all of humanity. It's also why I really love our sermon bumper videos this summer. Sure, they're funny and ridiculous and we get a good laugh, but you remember them. You're going to remember which reality TV show Jonah was a part of, or the news article that you just saw about Elisha. And odds are, if you remember it, you're going to learn something from it. So, as I was thinking about how I'd imagine this story in today's world, I kept wondering, who in our life, real or fiction, 
would be a really good example of a modern day Elisha. And actually last week in a conversation with Michael, our worship leader, he gave me an idea as he said, bears, beats, and Battlestar Galactica. So some of you out there probably recognize that if you're a fan of the TV show, The Office. And if you're not, let me just tell you, The Office is a mockumentary based in a paper company in Scranton, Pennsylvania. And it's one of the most eccentric characters of the show, the assistant to the regional manager, Dwight Schrute, that Michael was referring to. Because Dwight is obsessed with bears, because he likes hunting them, Beats, because he's a beet farmer and was raised that way, and Battlestar Galactica, just because he's a nerd. But he's also obsessed with doing his job really well and being friends with his boss and mentor, Michael Scott. Dwight even hopes that someday he'll be able to replace Michael as manager of this paper company. And if you don't think this sounds like Elisha, I'd like to remind you that Elisha wasn't scared of bears. And he, like Dwight, came from farming, actually. So he also studied under a great mentor. Ever heard of the prophet Elijah? He does the best possible job and studies emphatically so that he can do everything God wants him to when it comes time for him to replace Elijah. Plus, if you know the premise of Battlestar Galactica, you know it's about some of the last remaining humans in the galaxy, trying to stay alive as they're facing enemies, making their way towards Earth. And in Elisha's time period, the Israelites aren't on the run, but we know they were before when Moses led them into the Promised Land, and we know they will be again after all of the captivity period. And even now, they're still facing enemies within and without their kingdom. So, I think it sounds like Dwight is our modern-day Elisha. And if you disagree, I'd love to hear who you would recommend as the modern-day Elisha when the sermon's over. All this being said, I think it's important to look at the life of our prophet Elisha together. So, his story in general isn't that wild. He doesn't have a long book of crazy prophecies like some of the other people we'll discuss this summer. His story occurs pretty much entirely in the Book of Kings. And most of his life and actions are exactly what you would expect from a man of God. Uh, at the time that he's called in 1 Kings chapter 19, the great prophet Elijah is on the run because Queen Jezebel of Israel, wife to Ahab, wants him dead. So Elijah calls out to God in frustration and exhaustion, and God responds in a still small voice telling him that he's going to anoint the future king of Israel, the future king of Aram, and to anoint Elisha Abel Mehola, Shaphat's son, to succeed you as prophet. So in the midst of Elijah's biggest hardship, God sends someone. He sends him a mentee to help bear the board, burden. And you know, this is one of those times that God really puts all the pieces together clearly for us. In fact, Elisha's name in Hebrew actually means God is my salvation, which is a pretty fitting name for a prophet, especially a prophet called in the middle of his mentor's worst, hardest experiences in life. So I think because of that awesome meaning, we can forgive the fact that these two prophets who work closely together have really confusing names. To address that confusion, I'm just going to refer to Elijah as the mentor prophet from now on. So the mentor goes out and finds Elisha in the field plowing with a yoke of 12 oxen in front of him. And the mentor throws his coat over his shoulders as a symbol of the call from God. So Elisha says, okay, I'm going to go say goodbye to my parents, and then I'll come and follow you. And in his first act as a called prophet, he sacrifices his oxen, uses all his farming equipment to start a fire, boils the meat, and feeds the people around him. His first act as a prophet is feeding the people. And at this point, Elisha actually disappears from the Book of Kings for a few chapters. See, Elijah the mentor continues his ministry, and we can assume that Elisha is with him, studying, being mentored, helping do good work, 
but he doesn't show up by name again until the end of the mentor Elijah's story. So we're coming to the end of the great mentor prophet's time on earth, and he and Elisha are leaving Gogol. So the mentor turns to Elisha and says, God is sending me to Bethel, but you should stay here. And Elisha refuses to leave his side. So on their way, they run into another group of prophets in the time, and they go up to Elisha and say, you know, God's going to take your mentor from you pretty soon. And Elisha says, yeah, I know, but I don't want to talk about it. Stop. And then the exact same exchange happens on the way to Jericho and on the way to the Jordan River. Each time, Elisha refuses to leave his mentor's side. And each time, Elisha refuses to talk about what's coming. It feels like some kind of denial, like the one we all face when a loved one or a friend is near the end of their life. It's like you're anticipating the grief to come and you're not quite ready to face it yourself. Or you don't want to start grieving when you still have time to appreciate their company. So Elisha's been following and serving under Elijah for a while now, working really closely with him, and they've probably developed a really good friendship. It's really understandable that Elisha doesn't want to let his mentor go just yet. Plus, he may feel like there's a lot left to learn, because None of us feel totally ready when it's time to answer the call, do we? But when the time comes, Elisha doesn't do anything to stop his mentor's exit. He simply refuses to let him leave alone. He stays by his side right up till the end. So Elisha follows his mentor across the Jordan River, walking on dry land because his mentor actually split the waters of the river by hitting it the surface with his coat kind of like Moses did with the Red Sea. Pretty amazing. So they've crossed the Jordan and they're talking and his mentor Elijah says, what do you want me to do for you before I'm taken away from you? So Elijah responds with, I want a double portion of your spirit. His mentor's response is that this wish will be granted to him if God allows him to watch and see the moment Elijah leaves the earth. So they continue talking, and moments later, the mentor Elijah is taken to heaven in a whirlwind. And this is actually the answer to the two truths and a lie if you've kept up. It wasn't Elisha who left the earth in a whirlwind. It was Elijah. But now that Elisha has seen his mentor leave, he will be granted his wish. He gets a double portion of Elijah's spirit. So he bends down and picks up his mentor's coat that fell to the earth and hits the river. And he crosses on dry land, now entering into the ranks of other great anointed leaders of God, other great miracle workers. So he gets this double portion. And actually, in the time period, people used to refer to a double, double portion as what the eldest son would inherit from their father when he passed. It was their birthright. So the firstborn gets, you know, almost everything, and there's a little left for everyone else. But Elisha's request here isn't just, I want extra spirit. It's, I want to be your firstborn spiritual son. Let me take over from you and succeed you as the leader prophet. And it's granted. In his last few moments with his mentor, Elisha could have asked for all the wisdom he wanted. He could have asked his mentor where he hid the money, and he could have asked, how do I become the most famous prophet in all eternity? But he doesn't ask for any of it. Instead, he just wants an extra large me measure of God's spirit to be with him because he knows it's the spirit of God working in Elijah that allowed him to do such miraculous work and have such great strength. So he wants this to be able to accomplish all of the responsibilities set before him. And in fact, in his lifetime, Elisha performs twice as many miracles as his mentor Elijah did. And his first act as Elijah's successor is to heal a poison spring compared to his mentor's first act as prophet, which 
was to close heaven for three and a half years. And it was during Elisha's ministry that worship of the Canaanite god Baal was eradicated from Israel. Of course, evil and idolatry still existed or there wouldn't be captivity later. But all in all, our prophet and his ministry was life-giving and restorative. He was seen as a man with a gentle spirit and as a political activist. In fact, the only time that Elisha is mentioned by name in the New Testament, Jesus names him as someone who went out of his way to include an outsider. And some of Elisha's uh, in his decades of ministry include great things like healing water, assisting kings of Israel, Judah, and Edom in battle, helping a widow pay a debt so her sons aren't sold to slavery, granting a son to a faithful Shunammite woman, and then when he gets sick and dies later, he comes back to revive him. He heals the sick, he makes an axe head float, ends famine, allows people to see the army of God all around them, and even when he's dead and buried, a corpse of a dead man was thrown on Elisha's body, and as soon as he touched the bones of the prophet, that man breathed again. So the Spirit of God was with Elisha in great measure, and his ministry truly breathed life into the Israelite community, just as his name says, God is my salvation. Now, if he does all this, why do you think he starts his time as a prophet in such a wild way? Like, why start with evil? I think the only way to recognize that is to talk about this event. So, reading our passage again. Then he went up from there to Bethel, and as he was going up the road, some youths came from the city and mocked him, and said to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. So he turned around and looked at them, and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. Then he went from there to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. So you've got to remember that this isn't too long after his mentor Elijah is taken from him. So Elisha says goodbye to his friend, heals a poison spring in Jericho, and now he's traveling up to Bethel. Probably because Jericho and Bethel are two of the few cities that had schools of prophets. Places where some of the younger prophets would come and train up under the bigger names that had a lot of experience like Samuel, Elijah, and now Elisha himself. And on his way, he comes across a group of people that, depending on your translation, is referred to as youth, or children, or even young men. And the Hebrew word here is actually ne'er, which, while translated as that sometimes, is also used to refer to an official or a servant. And they don't attach an age to that, just an official or servant. In fact, the writers of Kings use the Hebrew word ne'er to describe the advisors of King Rehoboam, whose advice led to the split of Israel into two kingdoms. So I think it's safe for us to say that these weren't children attacked by the bears. At the very least, they were young men in their late teens, early 20s, they knew what they were doing. They knew how to make the right choices. And they knew not to use foul words towards a man of God, but they did. And in some of our translations, we see the phrase, go up specifically, or sometimes just get away, get out of town, go, go. But some people say that using the phrase go up was actually their way of kind of poking fun at the miracle of Elijah leaving the earth. They've heard about this story at this point, and they say, ha ha, yeah, that's not true. I don't believe it. So Elisha comes walking by, and they say, why don't you just go on up to heaven, kind of like you claim Elijah did? And even if this isn't the point of their jeering, they still want him out of town, because Bethel, back at the initial split of the two kingdoms, was set up as a city of idolatry. See, King Jeroboam set Dan and Bethel as two places of worship with golden calves, much like the ones that Aaron made at Mount Sinai, because he was afraid of his people continuing to travel to Jerusalem for worship and then reassimilating into the southern kingdom. So Bethel was built on idol worship. 
They lacked any real reverence for God. They don't respect him. They don't respect God's prophets. They don't want to hear his words. So they're heckling Elisha and telling him, get out of town because you and your word of God aren't welcome here. And at least one article I read also suggests that some of these men likely made a living transporting usable water down to Jericho, which happens to not be a thing anymore since Elisha healed the springs down there. So these guys are put out of work. Pile that on top of a city founding hatred of God? Definitely not kids making these jokes. And keep in mind that for Elisha, it was probably a really hard point. He was traveling about 25 miles from Jericho to Bethel, and it's not just walking a straight and flat path. He goes from 1,300 feet below sea level to like 2,000 feet above. So he's tired, he's exhausted, his body's aching. He may still be grieving and sad because it's not long after Elijah left him. So if we're all honest with ourselves, I bet we'd admit that his reaction here is pretty human. I mean, he's tired, angry, sad, curse. I bet you've done that, even if you've only said a curse under your breath. But note that all Elijah does here is curse. He doesn't judge these guys. He doesn't attack them. He leaves it all up to God. So while it could have been a coincidence that the bears came out, if anyone sent the bears, it was God who sent the bears. And 42 of the youth were mauled. Doesn't say they were killed, it says they were mauled. And 42 specifically because 42 is an evil number. So even knowing all this, the situation feels problematic to us still, right? I mean, it's not the happy feel good Christianity. It's not the image of a happy loving God, but it's the image of the God who in Leviticus proclaimed, then if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, and your highways shall become desolate. God was serious. God wanted people to obey God's word. God wanted people to respect God's chosen prophets. So when they didn't, he sent beasts among them. But I think you could see a touch of mercy here. I mean, he threatened to rob people of their children, and he didn't do that. He just severely hurt the children. You know, mauled or mangled or tore, depending on your translation. Never says killed. So they've at least got a chance to like heal from these injuries and make better choices in the future, right? So what we should learn from all this is, I don't know, don't make fun of people especially people with bald heads. Don't chase people out of town. Don't make fun of people preaching God's word. Fear the men of God. All good options. But what if we take our lesson from the city itself? I mean, where did the boys learn it was okay to make fun of a man of God in the first place? I don't think you can totally blame the parents for that. We know the whole city was behaving that way and felt angry towards God at the very least. Several generations were all acting with nothing but disrespect. And I mean, it takes a village to raise a kid, right? So maybe Elisha shouldn't have cursed the young men. But remember, he didn't bring the bears. And he lived an otherwise holy life, which is a lot more than some of God's other anointed in the Old Testament could say. But on the other hand, the city of Bethel definitely could have raised their children right. They could have taught them to revere the Lord and accept God's word from the prophets. They could have taught them that idol and pagan worship was bad and could lead to bad consequences. They could have taught them that jeering and poking fun, even if it's intended as a loving joke, can hurt someone's feelings. But positive and encouraging speech is never misinterpreted. And more than that, they could have done better at modeling it. I mean, sometimes we forget how much the youth and kids look up to us. The way we act is a lot more easy for them to model than just listening to the words we tell them to do, right? 
they see us grumble and they see us argue and curse and they'll also see us when we read our Bible or when we worship and when we serve others. So what kind of example are you setting? And how are you investing in our village? You could start by serving in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood this week or by teaching a lesson to our youth or just playing a game with them. We have plenty of opportunities to save our children and youth from the metaphorical bears of this world. How are you gonna help us out?